Hi, I'm Teresa Martin from Lower Cape TV, and welcome to the second season of The Minds of Summer, produced in partnership with the Cape Cod Institute, which brings leading thinkers and doers from around the world to its renowned week-long workshops right here on the Outer Cape. Today, we're going to look into the dynamics of organizations. That's the focus of a field of study called OD, or Organization Development. OD practitioners work to improve the way a group functions using the very human tools of behavioral science. In other words, applying people knowledge to create better functioning and healthier businesses, nonprofits, and other types of entities. With me today are Drs. Ala Hiarhidi and Jean Combert, who are taking a somewhat different approach to the way organizations live and breathe, using a lens called SEAM. Welcome to the Minds of Summer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me let me start a little bit by talking about organizations in general. You know, organizations you think of as these concrete kinds of things, but they have a an almost human soul. It seems like. So, do organizations have a sense of being? Yes. Yes. <laughs> How do they have a sense of being? <laughs> well, uh, if you you can call it culture, mm -hmm. that uh, every organization has a belief system. Mm -hmm. uh, often invisible, because culture is usually invisible, mm -hmm. and every or organization has its own, its own character, its own nature, mm -hmm. its own way of being, and you can tell that as you walk into different organizations. Some are friendly, some aren't. So you can just feel it sure. as you're there. Now, when you say an organization needs to change, how do you know an organization needs to change? Is there some kind of a flag? What what makes you say things aren't just going great the way they are and we need to rethink about how we do things? Aside from the obvious, you're making or losing money, but there, there's got to be other things in there. It's a good question, but very <laughs> complex. <laughs> uh, and complex because sometimes organizations do need to change because they are getting sick, but they do not want to admit they need to change. Yeah. And change is scary. <laughs> change is scary, right. Sometimes. Uh, Sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> um, so, but you're correct, there are some red flags, and sometimes outsiders probably are better to see the mm -hmm. red flags, uh, but sometimes organizations feel like they need to change. And if you think why actually anything changes, it's a reaction to the environment. Mm -hmm. Environment outside the organization changes, so in order to survive, the organization has to change. And so that would when they reach out to someone who looks at organizations the way you guys do and says, you know, come help me look at what's going on and how can we function better? Yes. Usually, yes. Yeah. OD consultants are those uh, change doctors that mm -hmm. help <laughs> organizations. <laughs> I like that. To go doctors through. of organizations. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. We actually think we do organizational therapy. Oh, that's an interesting kind of way of thinking about it. Talk to me a little bit about that. I like that, I like that image. Well, you, you asked it earlier about flags. Mm -hmm. um, some of the obvious ones are high turnover, people are unhappy, low mm -hmm. morale. Um, one of the recent Gallup polls, what is it, over 75% of employees are to some extent disengaged. That's scary. <laughs> That's across the country. Um, and those, that, if you think of those as signs of sickness in the organization, mm -hmm. the question becomes how do you heal them? Mm. And how do you heal them both so the individuals are healthy right. and happy and productive, mm -hmm. and so that the organization is healthy and happy and productive? Well, that's one thing I find really interesting about the approach that you take, because I know a lot of traditional management tools look at numbers, look at processes, look at things you can put down on a flow chart, and how does something move through. And it seems like your approach really sees organizations as driven by people, and how does this human factor play in there a great deal? Is that, is that fair? Yes and no. Okay. Do you want to do socioeconomic? I think I would do. Uh, the <coughs> approach to management or change work we uh, teach about is socioeconomic approach to management. Mm -hmm. And it takes into consideration two sides of the enterprise, the financial part or the bottom line right. and people. 
And it's neither uh, either or. It's actually that focus. It's that if you think of the word socioeconomic, mm -hmm. it's that dash. It's a dash. So the best example I can think of to introduce socioeconomic, it's a coin. Too bad I don't have a coin in front <laughs> of me. But if you look at the coin, neither side of the coin can exist on its own, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about socioeconomic, one side of the coin is socio people, mm -hmm. another side of the coin is monetary or money or economics. Mm -hmm. And the coin is valid. I mean, you operate with the coins, and that's how organizations should operate. They always have to have two foresight in mind. Mm -hmm. You cannot achieve good economical results if you neglect people. So how does that play out in the way you look at an organization? I mean, like yeah, if you think about uh, just numbers, you go, okay, we look at what our quarterly results are, we look at where our production bottlenecks are, there's like these concrete things. But when you're looking at both sides, where do you start? Mm -hmm. That's the complexity <laughs> of the That's process. what I mean. Complexity. That's, it's fascinating to me. Like, um, I think there are two different kinds of answers here. Uh -huh. One is there's a whole philosophy behind the socioeconomic management. Mm -hmm. And one is what we actually do when we go into an organization, mm -hmm. which isn't very preachy, <laughs> um, but acts out the philosophy. So the philosophy is that um, the value added in organizations mm -hmm. is people. Mm -hmm. And we hear all the time people are our most important asset. Right. And then organizations act differently. <laughs> they oh. fire people. In fact, they this is punish the first people. asset that would go away, you know, people right. are fired right away yeah. to save money. The socioeconomic management says people really are where value comes from. Mm -hmm. And so you have to start off valuing people. You really have to respect their needs. Mm -hmm if you want them to serve the organization well. Uh, I think traditional management, mm -hmm. and uh, coming out of business schools, assumes that people will be obedient. Mm -hmm. You get hired, you'll obey. Mm -hmm. Or at worst, you get hired, you sell your soul <laughs> in exchange yeah. for pay. Yeah. And you see that in places. You know, mm -hmm. 60, 70 hours a week, if you really want to get ahead, you know, forget family, forget anything else, right, right. you sell your soul. How do you have an organization that really treats people humanely? Mm -hmm. Both because that's right and because that's the way you'll get the most out of them. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> the point of, an organiza of a business organization is to be generating income. That's, a, that's an assumption. Oh. We would say that's a flawed assumption. That's an American assumption. That we that seem as a French approach, mm -hmm. and it says, yes, and the other purpose of an mm -hmm. organization is to serve all the people in it. Ah. And by serving all the people in it, you have actually something our espoused ethics say we should do that, mm -hmm. our espoused beliefs say we should do that, right. our business training says no bottom line is the right, real right. answer. <laughs> The reason we went to SEAM is it takes both into account. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the history of SEAM, because I understand it's been around for about 40 years, early 70s. Uh, SEAM was born as a result of the doctoral dissertation of the founder of this method, Henri Saval, and uh, he realized that a lot of value added in organization comes not from the capital, not from the labor, but from the human potential. It's that mm -hmm. I said earlier that people add value in organizations. And he actually built uh, his further work on that uh, kind of dissertational mm -hmm. premise. In fact, a uh, socioeconomic approach to management, this discipline is very uh, evidence-based. It has 40 years of data. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think of this approach as both a theory and practice, every intervention in organization adds to the body of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we have very well documented uh, record of a change effort that I cannot say any OD or any change it's uh, the best organization. In, it's the best in the world. Have. Uh, and everything well documented and actually shows that change effort can be sustainable. 
um, in spite of the fact, in spite of some research that says uh, about 10% of OD intervention are successful, the rest mm -hmm. actually fail to sustain. The organization mm -hmm. f uh, falls back in the old routine and old practices. Right, as soon as the immediate effort is gone, everyone just the consultant back to leaves the organization. Yeah. Organization yeah. goes back to its old routine, mm -hmm. and socioeconomic approach to management allows the a, a change effort to sustain due to the uh, specific rigorous process, not rigid, but rigorous process, and building in infrastructure that helps a new. Uh, new practices, new people's behavior, uh, kind of mm -hmm. root, root in the culture. Earlier you had a very good question, what is the entity, what is the being of right. organization, John said culture, and it's uh, a blessing and a curse, because <laughs> in one way it just carries a lot of stuff, uh, mm -hmm. makes the organization who it is, or what it is, mm -hmm. Uh, on the other hand, the moment you want to change it, it really resists mm -hmm. resist that entity that now operates separately from individual people very much resists yeah. the change. Well, it was interesting. You said therapy, you said the therapy before. And uh, it struck me as interesting because you think about, you know, family therapy, right? And you've got these individuals, but then there's this also this entity that its whole dynamics have to change. And it seems it's what you just described is very much the same thing. Uh, it's systems theory and which is organizational and right. family systems theory come from the same roots. Uh -huh. So I know that you have a, an institute and a, and a website, and I was looking at some of the articles there. If someone's interested, what is that website? Just so you know. It's www.seaminstitute.org. Seam Institute and Seam, S-E-A-M which stands but behind a socioeconomic right. <laughs> approach to management. Well, one of the things I read in one of the articles in there, um, you talk about dysfunctions. And one of the big dysfunctions you talk about is management is one of it's like the big dysfunction. Now, I'm just picturing, you know, senior manager reading that and going, uh, wait a second. It's like, wait, I'm responsible for, for this dysfunction. Is that, is that what you mean by that? Everybody is responsible organizations <laughs> for what's ho what's happening, can you know, and uh, people deserve the leadership they have. Uh, but uh, socioeconomic approach to management uh, is actually a, a nice way to teach or reteach managers, leaders, how to manage people, not only processes. Mm -hmm. And somehow in our Western uh, societies, uh, manager assume that they have to manage processes and people just part of the process, part of the system. Right. And uh, I think SEAM places a lot of attention on how do you uh, support, nurture people so they are in charge of the processes. Mm -hmm. And the role of managers and leaders, we like the word steer, so the, the, the role of the leaders to mm -hmm. steer organization, which is both leading and managing. Mm -hmm. no, I, th I think it's fair to say there are some very good managers out there. We're, mm -hmm. we're not saying everybody's bad right. manager. Mm -hmm. But the, the uh, tradition in this country mm -hmm. is one that does not tend to uh, support the, the managing of the health of people, mm -hmm. of the value of people. Could you give an example of, you know, to name names, but of a typical kind of adjustment you might suggest a company make when they're saying, how do we, how do we manage people more like people? Or there, is there any concrete things you say, here's something many organizations do they could do differently? We, we wouldn't come in like you're suggesting. Uh -huh. we, we, we go into an organization, we, we train the leaders in the, in the belief system and the, the concepts of SEAM. We teach them a series of six management tools. Mm -hmm. um, we intervene, interviewing everybody, or right. at least a third of the people, feeding back, here's what you're saying isn't working. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we, we don't need to fix anything that's working. OK, that's good to hear. <laughs> but in every place, there are things that don't work. Mm -hmm. And so we, we hear, we say, here's what you've told us. Mm -hmm. Check the validity of that. Everything that doesn't work has a hidden cost. I was going to ask about that because that was another interesting statement about the hidden yeah. cost. And hidden costs are the costs that aren't measured by traditional accounting. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, the cost of turnover, mm. uh, the cost of absenteeism, right. 
um, etc. And we show them from the, all of the interviews, we discern what are all of the things that aren't working, the dysfunctions. Right. Right. We talk again with the leaders and mm -hmm. figure out the hidden costs, run it back by them. Mm -hmm. We come back a month later and say, here's what we think it all means, what we suggest you might do. Mm -hmm. And then they correct things. Bit by bit, and then change incrementally as they go. Yes, and all along we're coaching and nurturing mm -hmm. the leaders. Now, I know we've talked about <coughs> culture a little bit, and I know different industries have different cultures. Do you see any cultures that, different industries that might already be a little bit more like this? Or do you see any that are very, very traditional and could really benefit from a, this kind of a mirror? Um, 40 years of research, again, shows that uh, any organization would benefit from this approach right. because every organization has people and have, right. uh, and have right. processes. Um, however, the theme is not for every organization. It has to be the leaders who have the right values, mm -hmm. which is if you have a leader who thinks people are just a cogs, mm -hmm. uh, then we, we wouldn't work with such organization. Uh, it has to be a buy-in uh, of leaders and people, and uh, leaders have to support the process. Mm -hmm. The process is very, uh, we think of socioeconomic approach to management is uh, one of the best culture changing methods. Mm -hmm. If you really want to, um, I don't want to say the word fix, I don't like the word fixing the system, but making the system healthier. Mm -hmm. So it makes the system healthier, it uh, helps people, it builds trust, it creates a robust, good organization that can actually sustain and be successful. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's not the kind of organization, but the kind of leaders that determine where we go. Right. Do you see those leaders, like we hear, talk a lot about the emergence of, of tech sector and newer companies, mm -hmm. do you see younger, newer companies, led by perhaps younger people, having a different view influenced by a, a culture, a larger culture at a different time, or is it, do people tend to go into more of the same old once they get into that role? I think in the end there is such a, a strong mental model about mm -hmm. what management is mm -hmm. that it, it covers most organizations. Really? Then are some of the things, you know, we we like to think the world might have changed since the 70s, but maybe it hasn't as much as we think. I don't think it has. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Wow. When you really look at how organizations work, how people manage, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we taught OD. You know, I, yeah. I, I ran a doctoral program in OD, Ala taught in the mm -hmm. program. Uh, the core stuff coming out in the 60s and 70s still isn't being operationalized in most organizations. All these many years later. Mm -hmm. So we sort of know how things can function better, but we just don't implement it. We don't take time or maybe we are inertial and don't implement. The yeah. theories, all these theories are, boy, how, long, how old they are. McGregor wrote about theory Y, theory X in mm -hmm. the 60s, and we still look at the management and most of the management, most, again, not saying that there is mm -hmm. not good people, it's a theory X management in which managers know the best, People are there to perform jobs, right. and that's the way it is. And that's that. Now, we said a couple of times this, this concept originated in France. We talked about value systems. Does the, is the U.S. have a particularly different slant on management and how people are treated? Or is this a global challenge? Certainly Western world. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's all I know, so I can't right, speak right. for the East. But for the Western world, uh, we, we, we worked with an economics professor in uh, Kiev, Ukraine. He said, yep, this, this is same the same thing? problem here. <laughs> really? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you get the same thing in France. We're doing a French approach here. It's exactly the same. So we create these, these business entities. Well, for that matter, have you worked only with for-profit organizations or do you work with non-profit and educational organizations and is it the same culture throughout those as well? Uh, we work with non-profit actually. Uh -huh. uh, cultures may be the same, uh, but what we are looking, uh, cultures may be not the same, but what we are looking for, those red flags as you right. mentioned, are the same everywhere. 
it's disrespect of people and people not particular people individuals it's mm -hmm. disrespect of people as a mass within the organization if you look yeah. even in um, non-profit organization I would say they're more enslaving their employees and even for profit right. because people there do more stuff for less money they are driven <laughs> by their values we are there to serve our patients our students uh, right. our less fortunate people and uh, employees are really kind of, um, I know, they are burning out. Wow. One of the ironies, we, most of our work, as Ella said, is healthcare, nonprofits, education, mm -hmm. higher mm -hmm. education. Uh, I, I suspect these are the harder organizations to work with. Why is that? Um, in, in, if you're a manufacturing organization, your goal is pretty clear, your processes are pretty right, clear, right. your management system is pretty clear. Healthcare is wild. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's in flux. <laughs> in flux, deeply in trouble, heavily regulated, and mm -hmm. usually the physicians are, or some or all of the physicians are not in the employ of the hospital. So, how do you do change when a number of the key players aren't in your employ? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's one. That's if you go to a college, faculty are in charge of curriculum mm -hmm. and teaching. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, again, you have a, a management structure that isn't really straight linear. It's much more complex. Right. The structure that <coughs> perpetuates us versus the mentality. Right. Well, that, that's why I almost hear you saying that no matter where you are, no matter what kind of organization you're in, there's this thing in people that you put them into an organization and suddenly this core value seems to shift in how they treat other people. It's fascinating. And often, not always, because there are some really right. good places out there. Right. There's some great organizations out there. We, we, that's important to say. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, how do, you know, do we need to make change at another whole level? I mean, is this something we've changed sort of in our societal view or in the way we, I, I don't know. It, it seems like it's much bigger than how do you structure an organization? It's something that's almost been taught into us in some other form from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> so how, I mean, yes. How, is there hope here? It's, it yes. is hope, yes. <laughs> there is hope. That's why we're doing this work and we see the results. And um, uh, it's not about how do we do structure differently, at how we treat people, how we treat people in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Uh, and treating, I don't think of small perks, we're doing them extra breaks or something, and those are also right. important. We are talking about philosophically, how do you really approach the role of the person in the organization? And the sim treats people as uh, value-creating uh, individuals. Mm -hmm. It's that uh, force that would do value added. For, for instance, if you had a workplace in which everybody came to work, thought their work was deeply meaningful, mm -hmm. enjoyed it, felt supported, mm -hmm. and had the potential to be creative. I mean, that's a place where human potential can right. really get used, and if people come and work like that, that company will thrive. On comparing to that, that statistic you cited at the very beginning of 77 people, percent of the people being disengaged in some way. To some extent, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, wow. <laughs> And actually, what we're seeing is the SEAM approach can help people, it may not be perfect, mm -hmm. but get much closer to that ideal. A story, a quick one. I was going like. to ask, actually, because I like concrete examples. Exactly, storytelling. <laughs> Do you want to tell it or shall I? Go ahead. You, you probably know, I cannot read your mind, right? <laughs> probably you have a story in your mind. I think you can read it. Uh, we were working with a, a public school system with a very large transportation system. Mm -hmm. but 123 drivers, and they had five mechanics. And we went in. The mechanics were used to nobody listening to them. You know, they're high school grads. They were maybe they they worked on the buses. Right. Nobody listened to them. They felt unvalued. Mm -hmm. As the seam process worked its way through the transportation department, they started recognizing that they were the ones who knew what the problems were. Mm -hmm. They could tell what what patterns were happening that, that hurt the buses, right. that caused hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of waste, they could tell which drivers had pr problems and needed retraining. So finally, they started talking to the trainers. The mm -hmm. trainers started training differently 
actually. It's a feedback loop. Oh, it's it's yes, an, a data-based yes. or an evidence-based yes. approach. They cut accidents by 20%. Wow. So that's helping economics, but it starts with that socio, these people feeling valued, listening to, right. encouraged to speak. And they recognize that in, uh, this is Minneapolis, there mm -hmm. was a bus company in Chicago, and their engines had a flaw. Mm -hmm. And they were having to fix these things all over the country. This small group of mechanics figured out what the problem was, went to Chicago, told them, mm -hmm. and they fixed the engines. This is five kind of uh. guys who felt never heard, so they never spoke up transformed. That for me is human potential getting that's, used. That's beautiful. And it all starts with saying we respect and value what it is you do, whatever that role is. Absolutely. And we listen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Which sounds like it should be so commonsensical, but I, I know it isn't. And you hit right on something because very often the most profound things are very simple. Mm -hmm. Very simple and somehow people don't do this. So in a way, socioeconomic approach to management is common sense. We just finished a session with our participants. Mm -hmm. and they were asking, it's so great. Why not all America is on board? Mm -hmm. What is it that prevents people to do this? It's so great. So the question is, what is it that prevents organizations well, yeah. doing this? It's a bunch of things. It's a bunch of things. And, um, but I think maybe inertia. Maybe people don't like to change. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, they don't trust. Maybe a change fatigue, and so it's harder to take a on a new initiative. A series of failed <laughs> change efforts. Yeah, and then you yes. say, "I'm never forget it. We'll just yeah. do it." Yeah. Uh, now, one of the reasons I think SEEM is unknown is it was has mostly been done in, in French and Spanish-speaking mm -hmm. countries. Alain and I are the only people licensed by the the people who mm -hmm. created SEEM to do this work in this country. There will be more at some point, but it, it, it's just starting into the English-speaking world, which is one of the reasons I think it's so little known. Mm -hmm. Well, believe it or not, we are actually running out of time. It has just absolutely flown by. Um, so I want to thank you again for joining us here on Minds of Summer. And I'm Teresa Martin with Lower Cape TV, and we've been talking about SEAM, a different way to look at organizational culture, organization development, and making an organization a better healthier and more powerfully functioning place. And that URL again if people are interested in SEAM? www.seaminstitute.org Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.